Hello and welcome back to interpreterprep.com. Although you may not be aware of it, there's a whole lot going on every time you put something in your mouth. Wouldn't you like to know what happens to that yummy pasta once it enters the mouth? Well then, let's get started on the journey. We'll be following that morsel of food as it goes down the digestive system. This topic will be divided into four presentations and we'll make the necessary stops along the way to tell you about the signs and symptoms of disease and to make mention of some of the diseases that affect each part of the digestive system. The digestive system can be divided into two parts. The upper GI tract, here outlined in red, consists of the mouth, also known as the oral cavity, the throat, also known as the pharynx, the esophagus, and the stomach. The second part is the lower GI tract, also outlined here in red, which consists of the small intestine, also known as the small bowel, and the large intestine, also known as the large bowel. The accessory digestive organs are the teeth, the tongue, the salivary glands, the liver and gallbladder, and the pancreas. In this first presentation, we're going to cover the mouth and all that's in it. You may want to pause this for a second and get a small mirror to have handy. Okay, so it all begins with that first bite of food entering the mouth. The lips seal the mouth so we can chew comfortably. The cheeks are the side walls of the mouth. Now, if you take your finger and lightly touch the outside of your cheek and then place the tip of your finger inside your mouth and touch the inside of the cheek, you'll notice a big difference, right? What you felt on the inside of the cheek was moist and called mucous membrane. It's the same piece of flesh, yet so different. Now, please take your tongue and lift it up to the roof of your mouth. That hard surface you feel there is called the hard palate. If you try, you may be able to follow it back with your tongue and you'll notice that it suddenly gets soft. That softness you feel there is the beginning of a flap of soft tissue called the soft palate. Please be aware that the function of the soft palate is to block food from going up into the nasopharynx when we swallow. When we swallow, food has to go down, not up. Now, if you have a small mirror, I invite you to open your mouth wide and put the mirror in front of your mouth. In the very back of your mouth, you can see a small cone-shaped structure dangling in the back of your throat. It's called the uvula and it's the ending of the soft palate. The uvula helps in producing sounds called uvular consonants. When, like when we say words that start in K or G, like Carl and good. It is also the part of the mouth some people tickle to provoke vomiting. Bulimics know this well, so you're warned. Don't tickle that unless you want to gag. Now, let's talk about the star of the show, the tongue. The tongue is the muscle man here, moving the food along, mixing it with the saliva, and then ushering it to the back to be swallowed. The tongue is also covered by mucous membrane and is located on the floor of the mouth within the curve of the jaw, also known as mandible. Apart from moving the food along, the tongue tells us how good the cooking was thanks to its taste buds, which can distinguish sweet, salt, sour, and bitter. Now, there are two organs there to fight off bugs. When I say bugs, I'm referring to viruses and bacteria. The organs are called the tonsils, seen here in yellow, behind the tongue. The tonsils are not part of the digestive system, but a part of our immune system. 
All the same, I thought it would be good to mention them. Doctors always look at them when you have a sore throat. As you may have noticed, your mouth is always moist. You have salivary glands to thank for that. In this image, the skin and a part of the jaw have been removed to show the salivary glands, which come in pairs and look here somewhat like cotton balls. The salivary glands are the parotid, observed below the earlobe in this image, the submandibular, located below the jaw, then we have the sublingual seen right below the tongue. Now if you take that mirror and you lift your tongue up, you can follow the lingual frenum, which is that cord that stretches from under the tongue to the floor of the mouth. Follow it down and you'll notice something sticking up on each side. Those are the sublinguals. They're right there. The saliva produced by the glands is secreted through ducts directly into the mouth and helps liquefy and lubricate the food and to start breaking it down. The chewed food mixed with the saliva is called the bolus. Last but not least, we have our teeth. Remember when we were kids and used to yank them out to give to the tooth fairy? Well, those teeth that the tooth fairy took are called the primary or deciduous teeth. There are 20 deciduous teeth. So if the fairy left you a dollar for each one, well, then you got 20 bucks. Now, if we remember historic route 66, the first six reminds us that the primary teeth start coming out at six months of age. And the second six reminds us that the permanent teeth make their appearance at six years of age. Now, the teeth are classified as incisors, which are the front teeth. They are sharp and used to take a bite out of something, like an apple, for example. Then we have the canines. These are the ones that Dracula made famous. They're known as fangs in animals, and they're used for tearing. Behind the canines, we have the premolars. The premolars have two projections, or cusps, as opposed to the canines, which only have a single cusp. Behind the premolars, we have the molars, which are larger, have multiple cusps, and a flatter surface. The function of the premolars and molars is to crush and grind food. The last molars are known as wisdom teeth. Now, we can identify three parts on a typical tooth. The top white part is called the crown, and it's covered by a hard, translucent substance known as enamel. The neck is the waistline of the tooth and located approximately where the tooth meets the gum. Then we have the root. Teeth have one or more prong-like projections through which they are attached to the jawbone. These are called the roots. Below the enamel is another hard substance called the dentin, which is less resistant than enamel and is yellowish in color. These layers, and I'm referring to the enamel and the dentin, protect the central part of the tooth, which is called the pulp, also known as root canal, which contains the nerves and blood vessels that keep the tooth alive. Now, before we go on, let's see some signs and symptoms of disease. A patient can complain of, for example, a toothache or a sore throat. A patient can also complain of a growth in the mouth known as a tumor or changes in color in the mouth like for example white spots. Now let's mention some diseases. We have the diseases of the lips. First I'll mention angular chylitis 
which is a medical name for that crack in the corner of the mouth where the lips meet. Then we have herpes labialis. Consists of cold sores, which are small blisters that appear on the lip. It's caused by the herpes virus, and it takes all the romance out of a kiss, I can assure you. Then you have cancer of the lip. It's more frequent on the lower lip and in smokers. Then we have chap lips. We've all had this at one time or another. Then we have diseases of the tongue. Glossitis. Glossitis is the inflammation of the tongue. When the tongue is inflamed, it gets red, it's tender, and has a smooth appearance. We also have tongue cancer. This is what guitarist Eddie Van Halen had. Smoking is bad and can cause tongue cancer. HPV infection has also been linked to tongue cancer. Then we have a disease of the mandible, also known as jaw, known as TMJ syndrome. There's pain and cracking at the mandibular joint. The mandibular joint is the one you use to open and close your mouth. And TMJ stands for temporal mandibular joint. Then we have the diseases of the tonsil. We have the inflammation of the tonsils, known as tonsillitis. This is usually accompanied by inflammation of the pharynx, known as pharyngitis, which causes a sore throat. Now we'll mention the diseases of the salivary glands. Salivary glands can be affected by inflammatory processes like parotitis. And no, I'm not talking about a sick bird, okay? Parotitis is the inflammation of the parotid gland caused by a virus and commonly known as the mumps, seen mostly in children. There's also tumors of the salivary glands, and the salivary glands can develop stones in their ducts, just like occurs in the kidney or in the gallbladder. The gland begins to hurt when eating. Now we'll mention the uh, diseases of the oral cavity. We have atherostomatitis. This refers to those small but painful ulcers that break out inside the mouth, also known as canker sores. Then we have oral leukoplakia. This is a white precancerous lesion that can occur anywhere in the mouth. Precancerous means that if left untreated, it can become cancer. Then we have thrush. Thrush is a yeast infection of the mouth, also characterized by white lesions. It looks like you ate cottage cheese and forgot to rinse your mouth out. It's commonly seen in people whose defenses are low. Then we have the uh, diseases of the teeth and gums. First of all, cavities. The first thing that occurs here is the buildup of plaque that progresses with time, affecting first the enamel, then the dentin, and in the final stage, invading the pulp. Ouch! Please do visit your dentist regularly. Then we have periodontal disease. On the left side, we see healthy gums and bone. On the right, however, the plaque, which built up over time, formed tartar, which provoked inflammation of the gum, known as gingivitis, and led to the formation of a pocket. A pocket just means that the space between the gum and the tooth got bigger, like we see here on the right, with wasting of the underlying bone, all of which exposes the neck of the tooth. It's like when you have a nest with an egg. If the nest gets too shallow, the egg will fall out of the nest. Periodontal disease does the same, loosening the tooth, which eventually falls off. Now we're going to mention some diagnostic methods. Most of the diseases of the mouth will be diagnosed by oral examination, which is the simple inspection and examination of the mouth. X-rays will sometimes be needed, 
At other times, a biopsy may be necessary in case of a suspicious lesion in the mouth. If I didn't mention it, a biopsy is the sampling of a tissue to be sent to a pathologist who will study the sample under the microscope and give a diagnosis. Now let's mention some of the treatments used to treat diseases of the mouth. Sometimes surgery will be necessary to remove tumors, for example. Antibiotics may be given to treat infections. The teeth are treated through the use of fillings. The cavity is cleaned out and the defect is filled with amalgam or another material. Now, when the cavity is too deep or too large, a root canal procedure is done in which the dentist gains access to the pulp to destroy the tooth's nerve so you don't feel pain anymore and then puts a crown on top. Extractions are done when a tooth can't be fixed. Bridges and implants are other treatment options used to replace missing teeth. Vitamins are given to treat glossitis and there is a vaccine on the market to prevent mumps called MMR. Specialists who treat these diseases are dentists, oral and maxillofacial surgeons, head and neck surgeons, and others.